Hey everyone, welcome back. This is the third episode of my Stravinsky analysis. I'm going through the Rite of Spring right now for my own purposes to just try and get as much detail out of this score as possible. There's a ton to learn from this score in terms of orchestration, as well as uh, instrumentation and pitch content, just how Stravinsky's putting together his harmonies and how he's uh, doubling and coupling his melodic lines. So I hope it's useful for you. I personally think that this is one of the most well orchestrated scores out there. It's also been very influential for a lot of film composers, like specifically John Williams used a lot of these passages for scoring parts of Star Wars, that sort of thing. So last time when we finished off, we finished here right before the large rhythmic section, the first dance. And in this case, this dance section that is set up next is probably one of the most iconic parts of this piece. In this case, we have these sort of pounding rhythms, which are all down bows in the strings and non-divisi. So that's very key. He's actually got, in this case, it's a third. No, no, it's a, sorry, it's a second. I hope my piano is less loud this time. Last time it was quite loud and uh, I clipped a couple times. I'm so sorry to your ears. Uh, in this case, we have strings. The first violins are playing seconds. And the second violins are playing thirds. This is an E flat dominant seventh chord. And underneath it, we have an E major chord, which Stravinsky has written as an F flat major chord. So we have this chord. It's uh, quite intense and pretty brutal. It gives me uh, metal vibes. So when I'm listening to this, I'm like, yeah, because I used to play as a metal guitarist in a couple like really small bands when I was a kid. Anyways, then these uh, this pounding rhythm in the background in the strings is punctuated every once in a while with eight horns that play that same chord whenever the strings accent. So we get this sense that there's this sort of there's two layers to it. There's the rep repetitive rhythmic aspect and then also the accented um, aspect to it. The interesting thing about this is that music before this tended to sort of just fit within the time signature. But Stravinsky here is making, he's doing everything he can to make sure that this fits outside of the time signature. In this case, the two moments that are accented are not on downbeats, they're on offbeats. They're on beats, they're on off beats. Then we have off beat, then we have down beat, then we have down beat, and then we have off beat again down here. So it's pretty clear from this that Stravinsky is trying to get a different rhythmic sense that we've sort of never heard before. And the term that's usually associated with Stravinsky, specifically with the Rite of Spring, is the revitalization of rhythm. In this case, we have something that doesn't feel like it's fitting in into the time signature. And then later on in this piece that we'll see many hours from now, the ending section. And this ending section uh, has a lot of switching time signatures, which was not very common in music up to this point. And those switching time signatures give it a huge sense of irregularity. I'm actually really excited to, to dive into analysis of that passage. Anyways, let's get into this. We're starting here at rehearsal 13. This is the Augurs of Spring, Dances of Young Girls. So in this case, we have strings. Uh, the strings is really straightforward use of strings. Actually, sorry, I misspoke. I said um, it's uh, first violins and second violins, but it's not. It's actually only low strings. He leaves out the first violins curiously. So we talked about this last time where he leaves out the first bassoon in a large passage, a tutti passage. And then when the bassoon comes back in up here, it's the first bassoon playing a solo. So he saves that. So I assume in this case, that the first violins are being saved for some reason. Perhaps in the next passage or in another section, first violins will play a melody or some kind of prominent role. And if that is the case, then he's probably saving them to deploy them later on. Another reason could also just be that he wants it to be low strings, and so he gives it to the second violins. Maybe in the orchestra that he knew was gonna perform this, he knew that they'd be sitting antiphonally, so like second violins and first violins on separate sides of the hall, or he knew that the second violins would be like behind the first violins and closer to the violas, so it just makes sense to orchestrate them together. There's all these small considerations. Again, I'm just making hypotheses here. I really just conjecture. We can't really know why Stravinsky made the choices he made. But 
I think with deductive logic and some strong reasoning, we can come to close approximations as to why he might have made the choices that he made. And then we can apply those, or we can apply that reasoning to our own work. So in this case, I could not have the first violins play if I knew the setup of the orchestra, or I could save them if they were gonna play more prominent material later on. Like I know there's this melody coming up and I really need that to be first violins. Let's just not have them play because I don't want to mess with the accompaniment then when later on the first violins have to stop being accompaniment and move up, that sort of thing. My perspective also is that it tends to be when I want to create large dramatic textures like this, I sort of throw everyone in. Like, let's get the bassoons playing and let's get the first violins playing as well. And just like, maybe there could be a little bit of timpani. But I think when we look at really masterfully put together scores like this score, you can see that the composers are using a lot of restraint. They just put in the players that need to be there. In this case, it's actually divided, or it's not divided strings, it's non-divisi strings, but just one player for each part. Now, the fact that they're non-divisi is actually gonna magnify the sound of this string orchestra. So when you divide strings, it tends to be that uh, a divided section of strings will end up sounding a maybe half as loud as the together sound. That's just because there are less people on each part. So the texture will sound thinner. Um, someone described it to like, you lose like 75 to 80% of the sound. Very interesting. So better for fragile textures, divisi, not particularly good for large, full tutti sounds. The other thing is that if you have um, non-divisi and you're doing multi, uh, double stops, you're actually gonna get a much larger sound because there are more like physical strings playing. I mean, literally the string, not the instrument, the strings. There are more strings that are vibrating. So there's more sound. So non-divisi is really good. If you wanna magnify sound, make it large. Think uh, the beginning of Tchaikovsky's Serenade for Strings. All of his strings are non-divisi there and they're, they create this giant string sound at the beginning of that passage. Beautiful passage. Um, but in this case, Stravinsky also wants to create that large sound, so non-divisi is obviously the way to go. If you're trying to create a more sensitive texture, something like Sibelius creates in his uh, in a lot of his symphonies, then in those cases, divisi is, is the perfect tool to use. So I think here it's uh, pretty self-explanatory. There's actually, uh, it's an eight bar section. I've done some analysis of all, of all this already. And I would say that it's kind of like these guys are primary material like the horns are primary material and the strings are background material. Really what it is, if we really want to do, if we want to be as precise as possible, which I think we should try strive to be precise, it's really they're playing one gesture. This is all one thing. There's a background pulsating rhythm and every once in a while it's accented aggressively. So let's take a listen to that. So you can see there that the horns are really just sticking out every once in a while and the strings are in the background holding down that rhythm. It's kind of like someone's dancing and they stomp every once in a while. I really think that that's the effect that he's trying to create here, especially because it's about like a, a ritual ceremony. Then uh, I've been thinking about this a lot in my own music recently, which is once you establish something that you're repeating a lot, it becomes hard to break the repetition. Because of that, because it's hard to break out of the repetition, it's nice to break the repetition as early as possible. Then the listener is sort of like, oh, I don't know, all bets are off. It could change at any moment. And Stravinsky does that here. And it's really interesting that his interception or his interruption here is the same material that was here in the first violin's pits. Dum, bum, dum, bum, bum, bum. So this idea then takes over, oops. This idea takes over. I would say it's it's definitely the main thematic material here. I'm gonna change my colors today. So this is definitely main thematic material. It's in English horn. It actually stays in the English horn for a large portion of this section. Again, he's following that orchestrational logic of strange winds have primary material. Everyone else is just kind of background stuff. Here, in this case, two bassoons playing background material. If we look at the background material here, which in this case is pizzicati celli and bassoons, so they have a staccato bassoons, so they have a similar quality. The celli are playing the 
it's like an E flat, it's like a, sorry, an E major sound with a minor third on top. And then the bassoons are kind of blurring the line between that because they're playing a C major chord with an E major chord underneath. So again, very blurred sound. We're quite unsure of what the harmony should be. And the English horn is holding down the flats, D flat, B flat, E flat. So we, we have a rough approximation of the harmony, which is E flat major plus E flat seven. So really Stravinsky is not doing much to change the harmony in this section. The only pitch that has really been added here is the C in here. This is the new pitch. So there's slightly a new flavor, but, but hardly any at all. Then we come back to the original material. I'm just gonna circle all this original material as red because we talked about it. It's pretty much all the same gesture anyways. This time it only happens for four bars. So the second time, instead of just directly repeating the same passage and having it run for eight more bars, Stravinsky says, no, we can just do an abridged version. It doesn't need to be as long. The listener already understands this material. The really interesting thing then is that he continues with this material, but he changes it dramatically. So in this case, we get these sort of like flourishes on top. They're like, they're, uh, it's like, sounds like very crisp winds. Uh, there are these great um, articulations. In this case, we can actually see why he's saving the first violins. So I'm gonna mark those as my um, green color, which is sort of like these little interjections. I think when you're listening to it, you probably hear it as primary material because they're a lot louder than everything else. Uh, but it's more of a um, an intermediate measure between this pounding rhythmic stuff with horns articulating and then the melody which is gonna come in in the trumpets. So that melody is gonna be the primary melody, a melody which has been uh, stolen for like every film score ever. <laughs> uh, so interesting also why he saves the first violins and their pits with the high winds. So clarinets, um, E flat clarinet and piccolo. So it has a really like bright strident sound. If this was Firebird, he would probably also put xylophone in with that to get as crisp a possible sound. I'm thinking Infernal Dance, the beginning of that. Then in this case, the strings are gonna move into the background now with this pounding rhythm. In this case, we have an additional element. Uh, no, I'm gonna put, sorry, strings are gonna be, they are not gonna be blue, they are gonna be yellow. Blue is gonna be the English horn because the English horn is playing that uh, dum bum 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 bum, which was established almost, uh, it was established as an ostinato before this section with the violins pizzicato. So we hear that as important material. And then here we have the main melodic material. Now trumpet is, trumpet, actually I should be really concise about this. Trumpet is doubled with oboe on the articulations, da, 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 doubled with oboe. So again, it's like uh, what Denis Boulian would call a super trumpet. <laughs> you've added the oboes to the trumpet. Trumpet is muted, so it's similar to an oboe sound. And then you've added oboes in to strengthen the texture a little bit. Oboes in octaves, trumpets playing the bottom octave of that. And then the trumpet discontinues in this little chromatic figure. Da, 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 dum, bum. And then the oboes echo that. So you, you feel like the line is moving back and forth. It's them both together, then it's just trumpet, and then it goes over to oboe next. So really it's just one line. That's really just one line. And then it actually arrives down here after you have the, the, uh, the oboes and the trumpet discontinue and then the strings take the line in pits, and then it arrives with, uh, yeah, another trumpet. So a trumpet playing on low. C trumpet again, first trumpet. So that's the whole line. It's really just one line. It's all chromatic descents, um, going from B flat down to F flat. So spanning a tritone, very goal-oriented melodic writing. The first time that it moves down chromatically, it moves from the B flat, down to G flat. Then the second time, it goes all the way down the full tritone. At the same time, there's this ostinato passage, dum bum 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 bum, and then the dun 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 in the background. 
Let's listen. So you can hear how all those parts connect together. You first have the trumpet, then you have uh, the oboe, then the pizzicato strings, and then the trumpet comes back in at the end to sort of sum everything up. The term for this that Schoenberg coined is Klangfarben melody. So it's tone color melody. The melody is moving through a bunch of tone colors. Schoenberg used it in a very literal sense where every single note had a different instrumental color. But in this case, Stravinsky is not going that far. All he's doing here is just breaking it up bar by bar so that each instrument sort of has a moment in the spotlight. It's important to think though that he likely did not compose this as a bunch of small fragments played by different, or thinking of them as small fragments that then all get assembled to one line. He probably just composed this as one line on the piano, wrote it down on one staff, and then when he was orchestrating, decided to split it up. Uh, you could also hear those really like uh, shrill hits in the winds, brah, brah, right before all of that started. So we can continue with our analysis here with, oops, sorry, with strings in yellow, playing accompaniment material, and the English horn throughout this entire page, playing the secondary material. All right, things are gonna get really interesting here at 16. I've notated it in green right now, and I've notated six eighth notes. So what Stravinsky is doing here is he's actually, he set up a texture underneath or an accompaniment under everything. This is a quintal accompaniment, diatonic. So E, E, B, F, C. It's six notes long, and he just repeats it over and over, regardless of how it lines up with the bar line. So it's moving at its own speed, and the bar line is moving at its own speed. On top of this, he superimposes this little C major viola idea, which is super simple, but is made more complex just by the fact that the, the um, uh, bass and celli are moving at different rates with pizzicati with different pitch material. Also, that C major idea is all tremolo. This is forming the background texture for this part or this section. So again, he's keeping, the interesting thing here is that he's actually keeping the strings in the background through most of this. Like the strings still have not had a big string moment where they've like delivered their huge string sound and we're like, wow, that's amazing. The strings are playing a completely different role than they ordinarily do in, in a traditional European orchestra. I would say that the bassoons here doing the tremolo are contributing to this background gesture. They're kind of like, he's been using these trills in, in the background to create that like harmonic glue almost. It's a sustained pitch through everything. So we got pizzicati, they don't have a lot of sustain. So let's add something in behind to just help reinforce a little bit. I think that the oboe is probably also con contributing to the background texture. It's two oboes, they're playing an octave, it's on off beats. It doesn't seem particularly important. It's probably just gonna add some, again, harmonic glue. The primary material of this section is very clearly the trumpets and clarinet part, which is right here key enough that <laughs> the celli breaks a uh, rule here where they, they play one note, which is part of the main melodic material or the main idea that's happening at the time. And then they switch back immediately into uh, accompaniment material. It tends not to be a great idea. It tends to not be a great idea to orchestrate instruments in this way. It seems to be better to just orchestrate each instrument in each phrase or each passage. They only do one thing, one role. If it's accompaniment, they were accompaniment the entire time. If it is melodic, they're melodic the entire time. You can see most of this with uh, Stravinsky's use of these instruments. In the previous section, the accompaniment stayed fixed in the strings. The winds and the violins played an inter, like an interjectory gesture just to kind of like get us to the main melodic idea. And then all the instruments that played main melodic material played main melodic material throughout the section. All right, let's listen to this. So you can hear, hear there the violas. They're kind of just in the background playing that C major arpeggiation. 
So this is a really brilliant, ba, ba, da, da, really brilliant. It's actually a quintal chord. So it's just stacked fifths, all perfect fifths. He actually has a piccolo trumpet to get a really high note up at the top. And then it's stacked fifths and the brass just play them as uh, repeated durations. The key thing here though, is that the clarinets get added in and they arpeggiate through the chord. Ba, ba, ba. That I think it plays a little bit better for the clarinet as an instrument. It's, it's a little bit easier for it to do more agile things rather than like a ba, 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 that kind of thing, which is much easier for the trumpet to do. So he's really playing up each instrument. On top of that, he also has these strings doing the sforzando pizzicati on high um, pizzicato notes to give that like shrill attack to this gesture. So when it comes in, it really like jumps out of, jumps out of the background like, whoa, really like it's hard. You can't not listen to it. Okay, I'm, I'm not gonna recircle this passage, uh, but we can go through and just quickly dissect what's happening. It's pretty simple, actually. You can see that the winds here have one gesture, which is this chaotic gesture. Uh, it's actually all of the pitch content is summed up by the flute, the bottom flute, flute two. It has this angular line and then this undulation and then more of an octave jump again, and then it stops. That is actually just divided between the first two piccolo and then the sec the first flute has a flutter tongue chromatic descent down. And that's really just blurring this gesture. So we can't really tell what's going on. Two ideas, or I guess it's all one idea. It's a blurred kind of wind flurry. The one gesture blurs it. The other one is the main pitch content, which Stravinsky then distributes between instruments. I think it's really nice here that he doesn't just write scales or something like that. He, he writes an actual gesture, so it has this chaotic character to it. Then immediately following that, we still have this alcinato in the background. It's just going throughout the entire thing in the English horn. Strings are continuing with this accompaniment pattern, viola moving every bar the exact same thing, moving through this C major material. And then the upper strings get added with pizzicati going back and forth between different notes. In this case, C, B flat, A, G, back and forth. It's kind of, they're irregular. It's a five, five uh, eighth notes first. Then they take a break. They do the main gesture. Then they go six and then seven. And then underneath all of this, we have the bass and the celli, which are rhythmically offset from the bar. And they're playing groups of six. So we have the flute idea, which is definitely the main idea. This is the main idea. Then it goes back to the brass and the clarinets and they have this similar idea. This time the string punctuation with the pizzicati is offset to the middle. So da 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 da. And then we go back to the winds and the winds have this same blurring effect. This time the flutter tongue chromatic material has been emphasized just slightly so that it's, it's a little bit more blurred the second time that it occurs. That's the flute stuff. You can really tell it's like very chaotic. And then these trumpets come in with this sort of militaristic rhythm almost. But we don't get the sense that it's European just because of the quintal construction of the chord. It sounds very fresh. And then all of this leads the winds die out. And at that moment, we have these big articulated, uh, very rhythmically unpredictable chords. It's like on the off offset triplets, and then it's on, a, on the and, on like the and of one, and then it's on the third triplet of beat two. And then all of this lines right back up with the bar line here at number 18. So this ostinato returns. It's the way it was at the beginning. It's just the strings and then uh, articulated with the horns at this point. It's interesting here that Stravinsky chooses not to use the second violins and instead uses the first violins. Perhaps what he's trying to create is the sense that this gesture has in, like increased a little bit or come forward in the orchestra, but it's probably just an orchestrational thing. He probably, maybe he's trying to give the second violins a break or something like that. Maybe it will also become clear as we progress on further. So here you can see he repeats pretty much this entire gesture. And then he does something very dramatic at 19. 
So here at 19, we have primary material here in the bassoons. This is a contra bassoon, uh, doubling with a regular bassoon, and then higher bassoon up an octave. They're rhythmically offset, so again, not starting on the downbeat. A lot of these melodic ideas do not start on the downbeat. It's quite rare for melodic ideas to start on the downbeat. They get this kind of clunky sound, like it's very predictable. Instead, he changes the accompaniment to piano, subito piano, on the downbeat, and then introduces the melodic idea right after that. So it's almost like we get a moment to appreciate, oh, dynamics changed. Oh, there's this different idea. Interesting. Bop, bop. Bum, 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 bum. And the bassoons have this kind of, uh, it's, a, it's a scalar idea. Ending here. When the idea ends, the accompaniment becomes loud and has accents. And then it goes back to piano and we have a brief moment where the accompaniment is piano and then the bassoons jump in again. And then as soon as the bassoons conclude their gesture, the main idea goes into the strings and it becomes forte again. Then the accompaniment becomes quiet and this time we have a... Uh, what is that? I don't know what that is. It's in, maybe it's... I think it's a trombone actually. Yeah, it's a trombone. We have trombone and then here we're going to get a contrapuntal use of this material. So the trombone right as it concludes, we get the bassoons that take over. Then we go back to forte accompaniment or forte, like the pounding gesture. It's sort of like he's he's taking one thing and saying, hey, this is really important. Then he puts that in the background and puts something else up in the forefront. And then he'll take the forefront idea away and let the accompaniment come through as the most important thing. This is possible because his accompaniment has these really unpredictable rhythms. These unpredictable rhythms where the accents are gonna land, it's either gonna be on the downbeat or on one of the offbeats. We're not quite sure where. Sometimes there are no accents in the entire bar, like this bar here, there are no accents. It just goes by without accents, but loud. That unpredictability makes us want to listen to it versus if you just put like, I don't know, some, ar some arpeggiated C major chord or something and then decided, oh, that's the primary material. Or your listeners would probably be bored pretty fast. There's just not that much going on. So here we have primary material again in the bassoons. And then he really trades off the role here. So he introduces this idea and then he introduces this idea and then he introduces this idea. Uh, the, the flutes on top, ba -da, ba -da, these uh, octaves, that's really just elaborating on what's happening in the oboes. So you can tell that the pitch material is the same. It's just making notes jump out every once in a while. Then he goes back to this idea and he has this idea. So these ideas, they all kind of intersect. And Stravinsky likes to do this. He likes to introduce things. He does this in his uh, Symphony in C at the, in the beginning of the very first movement where he'll introduce an idea. And then right when that idea concludes, the next idea will start. It's just like this eighth note, it concludes the next eighth note, the new idea starts. So we get this sense, we can hear both the ideas. Uh, maybe they're working in imitation like they are in this case. It's the same kind of scalar material, starting with a repeated note and then scalar material or starting with the scale and then doing the second section. So he in enters into this gesture in two different ways, but it's really the same material. In Symphony in C, he'll do that. He'll do that maybe once so that we hear their relationship. And then he sort of crowds them. So in, on each successive entry, the material is more and more and more overlapped. And then at some point, he'll usually introduce a third gesture to create even more chaos underneath everything. So they're all just like lining up or they're all, uh, it's, it's, it's essentially a stretto like we would have in a fugue where the fugue subject comes in too soon and then it's put in combination with its original, with the original uh, entrance of the subject, but in this case, it's not really that because the it's it's a stretto is in the sense that it's at different rhythmic um, at different rhythmic positions. So you can see here with the first one, we have the repeated notes, and then it steps down, and then the next one starts, and then this one starts here when it reaches the lowest note, and then when this one is still on the way up, the next one starts, and then this one has reached its lowest note and that one comes in. So they're coming in at all, all different rhythmic um, values. 
In terms of his use of intervals here, all of the winds are moving around in octaves. So that makes things really simple from the perspective of analysis. But everyone is actually starting on different pitches. The bassoons are starting on F, the oboes are starting on B flat, and the trombone is starting on E flat. I guess the oboes, when they come in again over here, they start on F. And the first bassoons start on B flat. Then we get this super dramatic ending gesture for this little section. You can tell that the section is going to end because he puts double bar lines. He also puts a fermata. So there's the composer signaling to us that this idea is somehow over. Here, he hits this huge pizzicato chord in the strings. Pretty sure he wants this to be non divisi So you strum across all four of the strings, creating a sort of chaotic sound because it's not all going to happen all at once. And then the all the horns come in. Is that Yeah, that's all the horns. All the horns and two trombones. Yeah, come in with this giant E flat. And then we have this kind of chaotic gesture where the strings play some arco notes. Um, the timpani goes bah, 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 and then the tuba, we land on the tuba at the end, which is going to jump out like crazy. So this is one of these moments where we have sort of a clang farben melody. I don't know. It's going to look like an upside down heart or a butt. Sorry. <laughs> but uh, this is all one gesture. This is just a little bit of connecting material that is orchestrated in a really interesting way. All right. Next section. Also key to note, there has not been a single passage in this work yet that has been every single instrument playing all together. Not once. We have not once had that. We've also not once had a moment where everyone played together for like two or three bars. Even the huge section that we did in the last episode, where it's all these chaotic winds and it looked like the page is just full and it's like hard to think that you could even fit in more notes. The strings were hardly playing and the brass was hardly playing. It was just winds. So Stravinsky is being very reserved in how he's using his orchestra. He's saying, well, that string sound, I haven't really given much string sound. There's been a little bit in background accompaniment textures, but not as a primary material delivering sound. He's also been very reserved with his brass. He's not using them like Mahler would, bringing them all in or having them play a large line or something like that, tutti, um, all together. Instead, they just, they play solos here and there, and the winds are really the primary, the primary instruments that are being used at this point. Let's see if we can we can hear that gesture there. So here we'll hear the bassoons. So you can hear there the bassoons go down, then the strings jump up in volume. And I'm going to try and get us. Okay. Here's going to be this large ending section. So we really hear that as this sort of, it's a pause almost from this relentless rhythmic drive. I think up until this point in this section, we have had only eighth note motion the entire time. Yeah. So there has always been some kind of eighth note, eighth note pulse under everything, this entire section so far. And then Stravinsky breaks it for two bars, this, these large sort of brass gestures landing on the tuba. And then again, he takes off with some winds right after that doing another chaotic thing. So we can see that here, that the winds and the, and the brass actually have this sort of descending gesture. It's almost like he wrote like some really simple thing. I'm gonna mess it up if I actually try and play it, but it's like, no, no. Oh, it's it's way up here. That's the the flute plays. So that's not the most important thing. Oh, it's this. So they're playing. It's like a you write like a little descending idea, and then after writing the descending idea, you go through and you go, okay, this instrument is going to take two of those notes. This instrument is going to take two of those notes, and you kind of have to do this in the orchestra just because one instrument is not going to be able to play that entire range. If you have a piano, you can do that easily. 
but you can't really do that easily if you have winds and trumpets. So he breaks them between all the instruments and he also gives the winds these grace note figures leading to each one of those notes to sort of blur things. On top of that, there's this little like clarinet gesture that's in the background. I will change the colors here. So we have primary material here, material here, and then in the background, we have this cool little clarinet thing. It's like, whoa, whoa. neat. So again, he's throwing in all these little gestures just to blur things. So he has one primary idea. Okay, we're gonna start on a high pitch. We're gonna jump through a bunch of other pitches and then land. And actually where it lands is this ostinato figure. Bum, 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 bum. I think actually he's using those pitches. So the ostinato figure again is D flat, B flat, E flat, B flat. He starts like that. He starts with, um, in the second piccolo, he starts D flat, B flat. Then in the oboe, he goes E flat, B flat, then D flat, B flat, and then E flat, B flat. So he's jumping down through the pitches of the ostinato. While he's doing that, he's adding in these little wind turns to kind of disguise the gesture and make it sound very fresh. And then he puts this clarinet thing in, in the middle of it with the trill and then nice. Just to blur things a little bit. And then he arrives on the ostinato after that. So we have this accompaniment material. Bum, 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 bum. Maybe we can think about the strings as accompaniment. They're doing these trill. Uh, there's a, yeah. So violin, great, a solo. <laughs> One guy doing a trill. And so very, uh, very pared down texture. It's gonna be very thin. With bassoon, they're doing the trill. And then the English horn has the dun 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 reestablishing that element. English horn, secondary material, playing the ostinato, or I guess in this case it's primary material because sometimes when you're doing these analysis, you have to make the choice if you're gonna call something like, are we gonna label it for its idea or where it is in the texture, foreground, middle ground, background. I'm kind of doing the foreground, middle ground, background approach and then trying to explain how that idea is motivically related to other things in the piece. So that's the same ostinato that we've had basically this entire time. It's basically always kind of been an English horn. Now, this is where Stravinsky starts to mess with it. He's starting to move the ostinato around. So you can see here, I've actually labeled that the ostinato then goes into, uh, into the trombone, I think. No trumpet, just trumpet. Here it becomes secondary, secondary material. These, those gestures are actually emphasizing the ostinati figure. So rup, rup, they're landing on the pitches that are the important pitches of the ostinati. Thrum, 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 landing on those notes. And then we have this, uh, I, I really hear this as primary material, this gesture here in the flutes. And it's, it's hard to, to Again, we talked about this last time where the horns were playing something and then the English horn and the bassoon were on top of it. And the horn was moving quickly in 16th notes and the other guys were moving very like much or at a slower speed. You kind of have, you hear more the line that is moving faster. In this case, Stravinsky lets us hear this. So here there's really only two ideas happening. I've marked this all in yellow because I was marking the ostinato in yellow before when I went through. But in this case, we only have two ideas. We have the primary material, which is this almost like, it's it's almost a complemental in nature. The primary, it jumps through because it seems like the new thing and we've heard the ostinato so much. So because we've heard the ostinato so much, it's like, yeah, we get it. It's just gonna go back and forth between these two pitches. So it seems a little bit less interesting than the strings and the, or not the string, not the strings. Um, the, uh, yeah, I guess it is. It's, uh, violas, and then uh, clarinets. We really hear this as, as like the new element that's been added, the thing that should be drawing our attention in. We have a moment here where the ostinato figure just continues, the instrumentation changes, and it's definitely primary because it's the only thing that's happening. And then we reestablish here this rhythmic dun, 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 dun. In this case though, coleño. So I, I'm not sure if he, Colinus, you know, oh, there you go. Maybe it's, uh, I think it's, uh, I don't actually know what that means. I should look that up. You guys gotta look that up. Put it in the comments, tell me what I'm missing. 
I think he's saying hit with or play with the wood and the and the and the hair. It's like bow on the side. Don't look at my bow technique. <laughs> Then the ostinato comes back in, and now he really develops out the background texture a lot here. So trill, there's this trill or tremolo. It's tr noted as a trill in some parts and a tremolo in other parts. Thanks, Stravinsky. I wonder if, I don't think he wants anything to be different between them. I'm just wondering if like, I, no, I don't think he wants anything to be different between them. He's writing the tremolo when it's a high note going to a low note, and he's writing the trill when it's a low note going to a high note. That's what he's doing. And then you have the alternation. I would probably, from like a modern scoring perspective, notate both as tremolo. So you can see this note moving to this note and this note moving to this note, and so that it's not unclear as to what's actually happening here. I went through and I did a little bit of analysis of this, and it's he's basically got a big F major chord happening, but it's basically just like a mush. It's like a, like a diatonic cluster essentially with like a tendency towards F major. And then on top of this, he has the ostinato. Or no, he, yeah, yeah, he has the ostinato. Action movie time. And that happens in the, uh, in the first violin. This is a moment where when I first listened to this piece, I was like, <gasps> because this horn line is the first moment that sounds kind of European. And I think I had that approach of like, oh, cause I had been listening to a ton of European music. So I was really familiar with the sound of like these big melodic lines or like a John Williams almost style moment. And then I hear this and I'm like, wow, that sounds like the music that I love and I've been listening to a lot. So this moment, it, it has that, the, the fact that he's using a horn, we get this, It's it sounds much more European. Uh, I'd say. Yeah, that sounds way more European. So it, it almost has like a, looking at like John Williams work, it, it sounds like very similar to Jurassic Park. <laughs> and uh, this, this melody really jumps out because you've just got string texture and a little bit of bassoons doing tremolo. And then this horn just comes in after a moment where there hasn't really been much primary material delivered. The ostinato changes. So then that, he changes the ostinato, but there's no real big change other than that. So this lack of primary material for a moment clears the stage for us to really hear this horn material. And then the horn is echoed by the flute. The flute plays similar gesture. It's based on the same melodic structure, but it has a much wider contour, which the flute is better at doing. Flute being primary there. The flute and the horn actually play the tail gesture here together. So the horn just sustains underneath the flute, and then they play the tail gesture together at the end. So one instrument, second instrument, and then they come together at the end of the melodic line or the end of the phrase, I guess, because it's sort of one phrase and then a second phrase. And at the end of the second phrase, they unite together. Everyone else, we have the ostinato, which I'm just going to label it as part of the accompaniment because everyone else is basically part of the accompaniment. And I'm going to do that. Oops, I messed up my, my zoom. I'm just going to show that the ostinato goes here, but then measure everyone else as, oops, forgot you bassoons. I'll measure everyone else as, I'll just put the star here. I'm gonna measure this because when you start getting strings all playing together, especially in this case where the ostinato is actually underneath the top string. So the top strings are playing. So the ostinato is underneath that. It just gets like sucked into the texture and you don't hear it as much anymore. The ostinato is the only part that has uh, black note harmony. So in this case, all, all flats, and then everyone else is naturals. So I think he's trying to differentiate them that way through pitch. But other than that, it gets sucked in. You, you don't hear it that prominently. Let's see if I can find this spot. Perfect, right here, Melissa. 
Okay, so English horn takes the ostinato there. English horn, bum, 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 bum. Before that, we were hearing the this uh, string and uh, clarinet idea, which I said was primary material. It really sounds like primary material when we listen to it. Then English horn takes the ostinato again. And then here, you're gonna hear, it goes, it becomes just, just this like almost blur. Ah, you can actually quite, you can hear that also quite well. Maybe, maybe the conductor is like, bring that out. That's important. I'm gonna circle it as secondary material, okay. Anyways, let's listen to this gorgeous horn line. Then echoed by flute. You can hear they come back together there with the ba so yeah, this also is going to continue throughout the entire thing. Alan Bell, I think he's referring to this section. And uh, supposedly uh, the choreographer for the ballet, Nijinsky, came in when Stravinsky was rehearsing the piece. And Stravinsky was playing it on the piano because he was the rehearsal pianist. And the dancers were all dancing, and he's playing this all now. Bum 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 bum. It's just unending in this tonality. It doesn't modulate. It just stays there. And then Nijinsky said, "Like, when does this end?" And Stravinsky said something like, "Uh, or it's like, like, uh, how long does this go for?" And Stravinsky says, "Like, until the end, my dear," or something like that. Just really funny. Like, it's just never ending. It's going to continue throughout the entire piece. Bum 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 bum. But I think there was a. Alan, Alan mentioned that there was probably some translation mistake between Stravinsky and Nijinsky. So like they, yeah, so they had like a different uh, um, thought of what was being talked about. I mean, I think he was saying until the end of this movement or this section. And Nijinsky thought he means until the end of the ballet, this is gonna just go for 30 minutes. Uh, in this section, we have the Ostinati continuing. And you can see how I've circled this one like crazy. This is another one of these Klangfarben melodies. It's actually the same melodic idea. So it starts with this, it's it's almost a figure that is a figure that's emulating that idea that we just had at the end of the horn and flute line. And then it immediately turns into this da 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 bum 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 that idea. But now they're like they're they're melded. So it's like this little gesture here is the ending of the previous line, but this gesture is the other gesture. Da, 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 da. And now he just strings them together. So he's like taking two different motives, split them apart, and then added them together. Really effective. It's definitely primary material. Like this. Ha ha. This is what 12 tone analysis looks like sometimes. <laughs> Everything else is obviously very much background material. Now this da, 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 da in the clarinets, I think that's probably going to come through as primary material. We'll have to wait and see when I listen to it. But then it immediately becomes background material because we have flutes and the flutes take this uh, main melodic material. Uh, yeah, four, four flats. It's actually five flats, but Stravinsky only writes four and then notates in the fifth flat. Talked to some of my students about this before. <laughs> Don't write too many accidentals in the key signature for your performers. They're going to make mistakes. Look at what Stravinsky does here. It's actually alto flute. That's another reason to do it. So alto flute has one more flat than everyone else. You can see that the, the main flute only has three flats, but the alto flute has four flats. And then when it comes to this note here, the G flat, which is actually a C flat, he just writes in the accidental. Nice. Good job, Stravinsky. Stravinsky would pass my composition courses. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> and then we have, now horn is joining the accompaniment idea. Yeah. So bringing more prominence to it. Everything else is background material. Very clearly just getting subsumed into the background. All right, here it is.
So you can hear the alto flute. Again, he's choosing a wind that is an atypical wind. He's not choosing just flute solo, flute solo. He's trying going, okay, it's gonna be weird. Gotta, <laughs> gotta not do the conventional thing. Everything against convention. Basically, we can sum this piece up like that. Okay, there's not gonna be a harmonic change for like five minutes. It's all gonna be one harmony. Then it's all gonna be eighth note rhythms. But the accents are gonna be at weird places so you can never anticipate where the accents are gonna come. All the phrases are gonna be different lengths. All of the soloists are gonna be playing strange instruments until the horn, which is maybe why that solo in my mind doesn't meld well with the rest of the piece. It sticks out. Um, so maybe if we were criticizing Stravinsky, it might've been better to write that so horn solo for maybe a muted horn or something like that. To try and change the characteristic just a little bit to have it pop out in a way that makes it sound a little bit less, less European. In this case, uh, yeah, he maintains this sound very well throughout this section. And then he's gonna go to the next level here, which I've written here, doubled in perfect fifths, which is obviously something that we don't do very much in common practice music. Like if you take a, <laughs> you take a uh, harmony course, they're gonna tell you never write parallel fifths. Well, Stravinsky's like, let's write all parallel fifths because that's not gonna sound like Mozart or anyone that had was even writing at this time. It's not gonna sound like that. People aren't doubling things in parallel fifths and having them move around. So that's what Stravinsky does. Top flute is emphasizing important pitches with staccati and the bottom two flutes, uh, alto flute and the regular flute. Am I wrong? Is it transpose? Oh no, it's not. It's not perfect fifths. Ah, I got myself. It's minor, or it's major ninths. Yay! Also atypical. Anyways, major ninths. Because the alto flute's playing in uh, A flat and the top flute's playing B flat. And then they move parallel through the line. Cool. We have this ostinato figure, which is just continuing. It just never stops. Again, until the end. There we go. Alto flute, yeah, he has two timpani players. You will never have two timpani players. You could just write this for one timpani player. But I think that the reason he's done two timpani players, maybe it makes it sound a little bit more chaotic. Um, it also helps with changing the pitch, the tuning of the drums later on. We will see that soon. I wanna just quickly analyze the way that he has uh, implemented this horn here. Okay, so he says, horn five solo, and then, okay, it just continues into horn five. So he writes the horn and they're playing staccati, so they can probably take small breaths in between. So it's not gonna tire out the horn player and, and kill the horn player. Don't kill your musicians, give them a chance to breathe. Okay, I have six minutes left. I actually feel like I've got through a lot of music today. It's probably because I had already done some analysis of it. So I don't need to dive in quite as deep. Uh, we have this background texture, which is continuing. These background textures that he's creating here are like oscillations in the strings. Dot, 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 dot. It's fourths. You can see the oboes are following it. Oh, sorry, clarinets. Parallel fourths. Again, really weird. Like a fourth is considered a dissonance in, in uh, most common practice music. So we try to resolve it nicely. Ah, beautiful. But in this case, he said, okay, well, I can use, I can utilize that sound to create this really wonky texture that's not going to allude to European music. So a fantastic video. Oh, I forget who did it. But it's about uh, the music of Avatar, and they were trying to invent a new musical language for the music of Avatar. And then the director, James Cameron, was just like, no, like it needs to sound better. <laughs> and they were like, but we're trying to create something new. And he said, it needs to sound better, which is more conventional, really. And then when we make everything sound very conventional, we just have everything sounding kind of boring. So in this case, Stravinsky is trying to use these parallel fourths to create that like novel feeling. Like this is something exotic that we, that we are not used to hearing. Again, that's historical because at the time people wouldn't have been used to hearing something like this. Now we have a lot of contemporary music and so our minds and our ears have been stretched. We have a broader context, but at the time, this piece would have sounded very novel, very new, and I think it would have been 
very shocking, I think. Well, that's why there was a riot, but okay, here we go. I think that this, uh, the ostinato figure is probably going to be take maybe a little bit more backseat. I'm not really sure what the clarinets are doing. That's what I'm trying to say. What are they doing? They're like doing these lines, these things. Ah, what are the clarinets doing? I think because it's like they're walking all over where the flutes are. Uh, the, the reason the flute is probably going to stand out is because they have the high flute. He has the high flute and the high flute is just above the range where the clarinets are playing. So the clarinets are like muddying everything else up. So it kind of seems like a moment of bad orchestration. What's important? I don't know. There's this like piccolo clarinet that's doing this like wild trill. And then like that's on important notes in the melodic line. So that makes sense. Excuse me. We'll just uh, circle that guy. Aha. Emphasizing, emphasizing things. And then these other clarinets are just hanging out in the middle doing wild stuff. I think it's background material. I don't think it's supposed to be that important, but I think it's functioning the same as a lot of the other blurring effects that he's created, these descending chromatic scales, trying to blur other material so that it's almost like it's harder to hear things clearly. He's trying to make it so that it's it's not easy to hear things clearly. Let's see this section or listen to this section. You can really hear the clarinets. I, I think that I can hear them so much that I'm going to say that this material is accompaniment material now and the clarinets are secondary material because your our ear is still tuned to hear this melody. We want to hear this melody. We've been listening to it for a bunch of time since the horn introduced it. Now we really want to hear it. I just thought of something which could be compositionally genius. When you introduce a melodic idea that you want the listener to be like, I remember that. I really remember that. At that moment, introduce it in an instrument that is incongruent with everything else you've been doing. So in this piece, Stravinsky has been using a lot of strange winds. Then he calms the texture down. So there's no primary material for a little while. And then introduces a melodic idea in the horn. High horn, fairly high horn as well. So it's gonna like jump out like crazy. That could be a, like a genius masterstroke. He has introduced it in this way so that our mind hears it and goes, that is very key. And then immediately he pivots back to the other material, the other instruments, winds in this case, goes to flute and allows the, it, that idea to sort of settle into the texture that he's already set up. Ah, I like that. I like that ex explanation. That's something that I could use in my music. Okay, I want something to stand out, do something that's very different than what I've done before throughout this entire piece. That'll make that idea stand out like crazy and people will memorize it faster. So there's this like, sometimes themes are really memorable like start like a lot of the music in Star Wars, the main melodic material. But then there's other times when you listen to a whole movie and you're like, I don't hear anything that's memorable, like the Avengers. <laughs> I listen through Avengers movies, uh, any Marvel movie, and I don't really hear a lot of like melodic ideas that I go, ah, oh, yeah, very memorable. Like the music works and it makes the movie more exciting and more emotional, but I don't hear a lot of themes that I go, ah, oh, yes, that's the theme for Captain America and that's the theme for Iron Man, that kind of thing. So... This ability to make themes memorable, maybe you can make themes memorable in this way that Stravinsky has demonstrated here. Just conjecture, but I would try and use that. I will try and use that in my own in my own work. Okay, this next page, I'm gonna have to zoom out. This page is the second time that Stravinsky has is now starting to approach getting everyone playing. Here we can actually see that he's got four trumpets playing. I think that this is in a sustained passage, the most brass that he has utilized to this point so far. And this is this uh, line that is really memorable. <laughs> really memorable. And this is when he brings the brass in to play this line. Again, he's doing, uh, he's applying layering here where he'll set something up. And then once he sets it up, 
he has the ability then to put something on top of it. And for that new idea to take the center stage and to have the other idea just fall back into the middle ground or background. So in this case, the first step that he does is he establishes this da -de -da -de -da -de -da -da -da, that idea. Once he establishes that idea, he then adds the clarinet flurry thing underneath it. Then after he's established that, he adds in the, the brass gesture. Let me see if I can play this here. Oh yeah. Okay, then he adds in that gesture underneath everything. That's definitely the primary material of this section. Let's notate this so that we have, okay. Trumpets, very clearly playing the most important material. I would say, Maybe maybe flutes are secondary. Sure, let's do flutes as secondary. Obviously, clarinet it's playing key notes in the flute part. Then we have this background blurring texture that's being created by the clarinets. And then everyone else, I think, is just fitting into uh, fitting into the background texture, with a notable exception. I'm actually going to have to grab a new color now because. <laughs> This is the first time that we've actually had something with this kind of density. We have these little flourishes in the strings, which is really the first time that we've ever had something like that. Obviously, we still have the ostinato. I'm just gonna, I need lots of colors for this page. Ostinato is here in trombone. So he's put it in an instrument, trombone and timpani actually. He's put it in an instrument, but he knows the ostinato will still be heard even when we have a quite full sound from the rest of the orchestra. I think everything else here is background texture. That's a lot. In passages like this, it gets hard to follow the main melodic line, uh, as we saw in the previous section like this, the chaotic section. I think the one thing that Stravinsky is doing here to make sure that we do indeed hear the main melodic line, he's put it in four trumpets. They're gonna have the ability to just cut through any amount of orchestral uh, activity. So he puts it in instruments that he knows this definitely will be heard. And he's trying then behind everything else to create this very dense texture. Strings are moving in the lower uh, register. Um, I think they're pizzicato, the low strings. Oh, that's actually really key. Uh, we have a uh, celli, high celli doubling, doubling the trumpets. High celli have a really emotional sound. It's really good at singing and, and, and being heard in the orchestra. So celli and trumpets playing main melodic material. Everyone else is going into the background. Okay, let's, uh, let's listen to this passage. So you can hear the that's the, the, the strings doing that. Um, that quick gesture in the background. Interesting. But really we hear this like, we hear this very active chaotic texture in the background, but it doesn't sound out of place because we've heard each element slowly layered in. And then he delivers the main melodic material in instruments that can be quite strong, high celli and uh, trumpet. It For me, it almost feels like poorly balanced, like the trumpet is sometimes more prominent and then the celli is other times more prominent. So it feels like this sound that's a little bit unstable. And I think that he wants that. He wants this sense of instability because that goes back to this idea of using atypical combinations to present lines. Um, I think it's Rimsky-Korsakov who says that it's basically impossible to get your strings and brass to blend together. They just have very different sounds and we can always hear the differentiation between the sounds versus something like all the brass or all the strings. They blend together exceptionally well. And then other instrument combos like uh, timpani, harp, those two blend together wonderfully. So you have to be careful about these doublings. The instruments blend together. That also makes them sound like they, they fit together, so that you should put them together. Um, but in this case, he wants to go for something that's a little bit atypical. So high celli and trumpets, neat. Anyways, that's gonna wrap up today's analysis. I'm almost through this section. We have got, so far with the recording that I'm going off of, we're six minutes into a 34 minute piece. Because of that, this is gonna take a while. So I hope you're enjoying it. I hope you're getting lots out of this. If you have any questions, 
uh, or any thoughts or things that I've missed, put them in the comments below and I'll see you in the next one.